Good morning, Pearl Church. Thank you so much for joining us here today. If you are online or in person, we're so glad to have you. Um, I'm Jesse Schmidt. This is my mother, Rosalind Schmidt, and my brother, Lucas Schmidt. And we're just going to lead you guys in some worship today. Um, so yeah, we're just going to pray really quickly as we invite God into this place. Holy Spirit, I just thank you that you're in this place, that you're in us, and you have found a home in our hearts and in our souls. And God, I just pray, Lord, that you would just invade every single mind, every single body, and every single heart today to just worship you to the fullest, Father. We just want to say that we're here for you, that you are enough, and we just say, King of glory, enter into this place and let us worship you with pure hearts and good intentions, Lord, that just want to bring glory to your name. Um, yeah, thank you for this time, and thank you for this space that we can worship you. In your name, Jesus, amen. amen. Thank you. 
nothing else in this world will do for her. Jesus, we just want to acknowledge right now as a congregation, say, shout out to you that there is nothing better than you. You are all that we need. And in these funny times that we find ourselves in, you are our anchor. And Father God, this is your magnificent plan for us, so birthed in your magnificent love for us, that you would send your son, Jesus, to be our anchor and to be all that we need. Thank you in this time, this Christmas time, Father, we want to adore you. We want to say that we so love what you, the gift you've given us because it has saved us. And we need your Holy Spirit to adore you, to give you the glory and the worth that you deserve. And so, Holy Spirit, we are asking right now that you would come, that you would fill us fill us with a new filling so that we can adore and worship the Father God and Jesus for this magnificent plan of coming to this earth to save us. And we just want to say we love you for that. We adore you. Holy Spirit, come now, we pray. Oh, there's nothing worth more that could ever come close. No thing can compare, you're our living hope, your presence, Lord. Oh, I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of love, where my heart becomes free. And my shame is undone in your presence, Lord. So, Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come fly this place and fill the atmosphere, cause your glory. Glory, God is what I 
Psalms this week and I came across Psalms 24 and I just thought it was so fitting for the season, the Christmas season, um, just as we prayed at the beginning that the King of Glory would just enter in. I was just pondering on this passage and I'm just going to read it. It's a really short chapter. A Psalm of David. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world of those who dwell therein. He has founded upon its seas and established it upon the rivers. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, he who does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully, he will receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from God of his salvation. Such is the generation of those who seek him, those who seek the face of God, of Jacob. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty, the Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and lift them up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. And the Psalms was written centuries and centuries before the coming of Jesus, but I think it speaks to the King of glory, that Jesus was the fullness of God coming to earth as a baby. And God, we just want to say that we just want to lift up our hands and open up our doors, open up the doors to our hearts and our lives for you to enter, Father. We just want to say that every single breath that you've given is from you, God, that we want to use it for your glory and for your benefit to bring others closer to the heart of God. And so, King of Glory, we just say, enter into this place. I thank you, Lord, that, that you came as a baby, yet it was the fullness of the glory of God in this person who is Jesus. And so, Jesus, we just want to give you the glory and use our lives, use our breath, use the way we think and the way we speak to honor you. Every heart that is broken 
Hey, good morning, church, and Merry Christmas. Come on, we've only got a few days left before we come together and we celebrate the birth of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Well, before we get to the word here today, I just want to give you a couple of announcements. And uh, you're seeing this online, but we are meeting in person. Uh, so just to let you know, the 27th, we'll be meeting in person again. And if you want to come and join us, please do so. Otherwise, we'll be online. And uh, I'm excited that God is doing something uh, in the midst of everything. A number of weeks ago, I made this comment that the moment that we are in does not pause the mission we are on. Jesus Christ is on the move. He's building his kingdom. He's turning hearts towards him. And I encourage you that this be a season not only for you to enjoy Jesus Christ personally in your home, in your family, renew that love relationship with him, the Savior born this Christmas day, and we celebrate the love of God. But would you also pray for others? Would you find a way to connect with others? Will you open your heart and your hands as much as it can with generosity to bless others during this Christmas time? Because we are partners with the Lord. And God wants to use you to maybe minister to a neighbor, to a, uh, somebody that's in your building, maybe to a family member. Somehow you can speak a word to those that, as the Word, the word of God says, lie in darkness. That they are this weary world, <laughs> is wondering what's going on and they need to rejoice. And the message we have is Jesus Christ. So I encourage you to do that. Now, a couple of announcements. Don't forget, we're coming to year end. Uh, December 31st is the uh, last day that we can receive tithes and offerings for the church, uh, for the kingdom of God and what God is doing in the earth. And I encourage you that uh, be faithful, continue in your generosity with regards to your tithes and offerings, giving unto the Lord and the work that God is doing in the earth. Don't forget that, but don't forget also that we are in January wanting to have some Zoom uh, classes, as it were, Bible studies, different topics. Get a hold of us. Let us know what kind of study would you like to be involved with? Would you like to be involved in a Zoom class where we can study the Word of God and encourage one another? Even though it's on Zoom, God can still speak to us. We've done that in the past. and It's going to be a great time in January, so be mindful of that. You know, one of the ways we can celebrate through this Christmas time, and though we're not seeing each other, is send in a Christmas selfie of you and your family, your loved ones, uh, maybe just yourself and your animals, and uh, let us know what your house looks like. Let us know uh, what you look like. Uh, just celebrate this Christmas by sending in one of the selfies, and we want to be able to show those. And uh, God is doing a great thing in the earth, and we're looking forward to that. So remember, get a hold of us that we can pray for you, that we can uh, speak into your life, encourage you, and just know where you're at. We're there for you. Well, God bless you. Enjoy the ministry of the Word today. Wow, it's good to look into the Word of God here this morning. We are still in our series called Wonder, and this is our third one. And the title today is simply, For Unto Us, For Unto Us. Passage coming out of the book of Isaiah chapter 9, and we're going to look at that in a few minutes. Uh, but you know what? Uh, I, I'm really excited that the, the Word of God can speak to us. It pulls us into the beautiful story of redemption that God has for mankind, and particularly even this Christmas story. It invites us to, to hear the Word for us. These are uh, scriptures identifying a time and a place with real people, Mary and Joseph and the shepherd and the wise men and Herod, uh, the innkeeper. These are real people of a real time, given an account of the real birth of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And uh, I, I think it's where we need to have this wonder. We need to have this excitement. Um, and Christmas time seems to gather us around this one time when it should be actually all year round. And we understand that. But uh, this emphasis at Christmas, the wonder of Christ's birth for you and I. But you know, it's crazy to think that uh, not just today in our lives, but even in the Bible, there were people that missed Jesus. They missed his birth, as it were. And just a couple of them, you think of the innkeeper. And in Luke chapter 2, verse 7, we read, And she, being Mary, brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in a swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them for the, at the inn. Uh, you know, we don't know the innkeeper's name. We don't know if it's a guy, a girl, if a husband, a wife, or who it was. Uh, we don't know. All we do know is there wasn't room made for the Son of God to be born in this particular 
in. Instead, Joseph would take his wife and this unborn child still in the womb and carry him out into what would actually be a, we call it a stable, but it wasn't a stable. It was really a, an outdoor pen where animals were stationed. And, uh, and we don't know what was said by the innkeeper. We don't know if the innkeeper was apologetic or perhaps he was just uncaring. Uh, maybe he was so hard-hearted, he didn't want to talk to anybody, as it were, that he just posted up a sign that said, no vacancy. I don't have time for you. I don't want to hear about anybody's story of why they need room. And he just wouldn't even come to the door. Uh, don't bother knocking. Uh, maybe the innkeeper uh, looked at Mary and Joseph and size them up, as it were, this young couple, but could tell by the way they're dressed and where they're coming from, maybe that they were coming from Nazareth. Now, you've got to understand, Nazareth was not a, a nice place. Nobody wants to go to Nazareth. Nobody wants to have a holiday at Nazareth. It was, as it were, the ghetto of the land. And uh, maybe he looked at them and judged them and says, hey, I don't want your kind. I don't want you to be a part of my clientele. We've got no room for you. You know, it was even said in the scriptures, prophesied of the old, said, can anything good come out of Nazareth? And that's how people felt about Nazareth. Mary and Joseph just didn't fit in, and neither would this child. Well, sometimes, you know, we can miss Christmas because we don't want to make room for the Son of God. We don't want to make room and give up, as it were, uh, what we're doing in life. See, we're tr busy trying to make a life. And in making a life for us, we don't have room for Jesus Christ to come in. Because we realize that, you know, what we're building takes our time and attention. and It's our priority. And, well, I just don't have room for Jesus, the Son of God, to come into my life right now. And yet Jesus is the one who says, I've come to bring life and life more abundant. The life you are building will never become the life God can provide if you don't make room for him. You know, sometimes we can be so distracted by the busyness of life that we just don't want to make room. We don't want to give up our choices of what we want to do in our life. Because if we give up our choices for him, that means something has to come out of our life that we've chosen. And we're not too sure what God's going to do in our lives, so we'll stick with our choices, as it were. And instead, we say, I'm all full up. My life is full. Right now, I'm full up. No, I got no more room. I, I got no room for the Son of God. I don't know how many times I've heard people say to me, you know, they just don't have room for Jesus right now, time for Jesus right now. And they say, hey, you know, when I get a little older, I'll have a little more time to really focus on my spiritual life. Or, you know what, uh, when my life is settled, when my finances is settled, when my job is settled, then I, I can make room. The problem is, is that we never know when our time is up. We try to settle it all the time, but we don't know when it's up. And the thing is, is that when we're busy trying to make a life and try to get things settled, the very God we're holding outside of our life is the very God that can come in and help us settle these things, that can help us with our life, our marriage, our finances, with our job, our, our career, our destiny. But we say, no, I, I've, I've got no room. And we can miss them simply because we don't give them room. You know, we can also miss them because we think we know them. We think we know him, but we actually miss him. You know, in Matthew chapter 2, uh, the wise men came from the east. They're following the star, and they come to Jerusalem, and they find Herod, the king of that day. And he says, you know what? We've come to find this other king, this king born, the king of Jews. Do you know where he is? Well, Herod has no idea about this king of the Jews, his baby being born. So he calls his religious leaders in, the religious people, the chief priests, the scribes, and, and he calls them in. And, and they want to know, where is this? And Herod says, you know, do you know about this guy? And they go, sure, of course we do. It's in our scriptures. We've read about it. And they, they begin to say, they, they quote Micah chapter 5 and verse 2. And they say this, oh, but you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, Though you're small among the classes of Judah, out of you will come for me, God says, one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. You see, these uh, scribes and these chief priests, they, they knew about the 400 and some prophecies that spoke of the Messiah, the Christ, the one that is coming, and ultimately the one that would be born in Bethlehem. 
They understood, and it wasn't a shock to them, but they missed Christ at Christmas because of their religious pride, their arrogance. They were religious. They didn't need some wise guys coming in to tell them about this Christ that is being born, this king that is being born. They're so proud. Well, listen to me. They would not go five miles from Jerusalem to Bethlehem to even go see this one that is called the Messiah, the one that is born king of the Jews. They wouldn't even go see him. You see, they felt they knew everything themselves. And if God was going to reveal a Messiah, they would be the first to know because they're so religious. They're so spiritual. They have everything together. They did not even meet Christ at Christmas because of their pride. And, you know, sometimes we can miss Christ at Christmas because we know it all. You know, I have my background. I was raised in church or I've read the scriptures. You know, I, I'm, I'm pretty close to God. You know, I've got my life is going pretty good. Uh, and what we do is we miss this beautiful, intimate time of getting to know who Christ is himself. I've read about him. I know about him. I, I can even quote scripture. But do you know him? Will you travel the short distance from your office, your home, your position to simply go and see him and meet him personally? But, you know, we can also miss Christ at Christmas because of Jesus' kingship. You know, his kingship threatens our kingship. In Matthew chapter 2, verse 3, it says, When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed with all the Jews with uh, Jerusalem with him. And one translation says he was troubled in all Jerusalem. There, there was a troubling because another authority is being announced that there's another king. And, and they, they like the way things were under the authority, under the rulership. And Herod thought, hey, I'm the king. There can't be another king. See, he wasn't just a baby. He would ultimately be the king of kings and the Lord of lords. All other thrones would be unseated, would be subjugated to his authority. Herod was not willing to only not worship Jesus, but he was threatened, threatened by the position of Jesus Christ, and he wanted to remove him as a threat. So when the wise men didn't return from finding and worshiping Jesus, and that angel directed him to go another way, well, all of a sudden, Herod got upset and he got jealous and he put out a decree. He says, all children, two years and younger, were to be killed in that area. When we're unwilling to lay down the throne of our own lives, where we say, hey, no one's going to be the boss of me. I will make my own decisions, make my own destiny. It all relies on me. When we are unwilling to give up our throne to Jesus Christ, who's ultimately king, we miss Jesus we will miss seeing it. Oh, he's a baby, beautiful little, cuddly little baby, swaddling cloths, but a king? No. I find it interesting that Christmas today is more, much more about the gifts that we get and the gifts that we give when Christmas was originally about the gift God gave. He gave Jesus Christ. You know, Luke chapter 2, verses 10 to 12 says this, but the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of Beth David, a Savior has been born, and he is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. God gave a gift of salvation in the form of a child and wrapped it up in swaddling cloths. But it was a gift that would be, listen to me, good news, bringing great joy, and would be for all people. You know, but today we do everything we can, right, to make sure we get the gift that's right. We check what's trending. We ask questions of what people want. Get the kids to check with mom and make sure we got the right gift going to mom. And then we pass the information around because, you see, there's nothing worse than giving a gift that somebody doesn't want. That somebody says, that's not what I really wanted, and there's sadness all of a sudden. So you fuss, you muse, you hunt to try to get it, and every once in a while you hit a home run. You know where everybody gets the right gifts, and everybody says, this is exactly what I wanted. How did you know it's what I wanted? There's happiness, there's joy. But then there's sometimes you strike out. Nobody's happy. You never got one right. It's just like, oh, the sinking feeling. And that's why it's so great that in 1994, come on, they came out with, you got it, gift cards. 
Come on, gift cards came out. You can buy anything at a store that people want now. You've got hunting shops, you've got golf shops, you've got cooking shops, you've got clothing shops, you've got toy shops, you got gas stores, and you've got bookstores. And then you've got Canadian Tire that has all those things. You can get gift cards for, for getting your nails done or buying a nail gun. You can buy gift cards for those that are Xbox gamers, and then you get a gift card for counseling to break addictions for those gamers. You can get cards for those that want tangerines and those that just want Listerine. Come on now, there is a gift card for anyone, but the best gift card of all is the Visa card. Come on, the Visa card that's preloaded, set up for you, and you can buy whatever you want now at any of the stores that we're offering the specifics. You can go to 10,000 stores and buy the things you want. Somebody else pays for it, loads it up, you get to spend it anywhere you want. And it can be whatever you need in whatever moment you have that need. Uh, it can be different uh, from 2019 to 2020 to, two, uh, uh, to 2021. It can be different for you and different for me, but it meets all the needs at any time you have a need. That's the Visa card. Can I tell you right now, God knows what you really need in this moment, this time, this place. And God's gift to you is a gift preloaded, as it were, with, with all the, the presence and the provision and the protection of God himself, the very person of God come in the flesh. Jesus Christ has everything that you have need of for today and tomorrow and the future. And it's been purchased by his blood there at the cross of Calvary and able to be used every day of your life. What's the best gift? Well, Jesus. But who is, what is, how is this gift working in our lives? And I believe Isaiah the prophet gives us this answer. Uh, in, in 700 years before Christ is born, he prophetically tells us, you know what, Isaiah uh, in chapter 9, it's like a birth announcement. It's like a birth announcement. It says, hey, it's a boy. 700 years beforehand. And then it says, hey, this is how it's going to happen. And another passage in chapter 7 says, it's going to be born by a virgin, by the way. So the delivery focus is there for us. But in chapter 9, Isaiah prophesies and says, it's not just a boy, but he tells us about his abilities, his provision, his position that's going to be in the earth. Can you imagine having a baby say, by, by the way, my baby's going to be a, this is before it's born. By the way, my, I'm going to have a boy. Uh, I just conceived. It's going to be a boy. No, before it's conceived, I'm going to have a boy. And that boy's going to be a doctor. It's going to be a lawyer. It's going to be a carpenter. It's going to be a, uh, some, some sort of vocation. And I can tell you right away, before he's even born, what he's going to be. Well, that's what Isaiah does. Isaiah prophesies about Jesus Christ. This beautiful baby announcing. And, and God is using Isaiah in the context of Isaiah to speak to a nation, to speak to Israel, God's people, following God, though they're in a time of trouble. The armies are gathered around them, and it's part of the judgment of God to get them back on course, get a course correction going on. But these enemies are coming, and it's difficult, and they're not too sure what's going on. It's a very dark time in the life of Israel. And Isaiah speaks to the people and gives a word from God that God will come and bring, as it were, a deliverer. God will speak a word of hope, a word of a light coming, as it were, into a dark time to deliver, to set free, to bring people this sense of hope that things are going to be okay. And Isaiah first describes the situation, and we know it speaks to us today. Isaiah 9, 2 says, The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. You know that sometimes, just like they did, we can go through a time of darkness. That it's dark. We don't see where we're going. I'm not too sure of the future. We're not too sure of our circumstances. There's isolation. There's coldness. There's a heaviness. That all of a sudden, we then go from a darkness to a deep darkness. Sometimes there are small problems. The small problems, all of a sudden, these small problems take on a, a life of their own that all of a sudden becomes bigger. It's worse. It's darker. It's deeper than I'd imagine. The pain is more sorrowful. The struggle is, is more difficult. We find it's more worse. It's painful. 
We have one problem and all of a sudden we find it has a twin. Now there's two problems and together they are just mounting up against us and we're not too sure what to do. It's darkness, but then it becomes deep darkness and it becomes a darkness you can feel. Sometimes there's a deep darkness in our soul, deep down in the places that nobody else sees. Nobody else knows about a deep darkness of our thoughts that we're having, the depression we're fighting, the anxieties that we're negotiating and navigating. Nobody knows the deep, dark places of our lives, and we, we hurt. We're, we're in pain, and we struggle, and we wonder, does anybody know what I'm going through? Does anybody understand my life right now? Is there anybody out there for me? And God comes to speak to us just like he did to Israel. It's a prophetic word to you and I. That those who are in darkness, deep darkness, a promise is coming, a hope is coming, a light is coming. That will step into our darkness, into our pain and into our struggle that nobody even knows about, that we can't even talk about. And God steps in to bring deliverance. And he says these words in Isaiah 9, 6. This is for us. This is of Jesus. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, the government will be on his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. I want you to hear those words at the beginning. For unto us, unto you, unto me, unto us today, yesterday, tomorrow, it's unto us and to everyone that is, that has, that is, will be going through a time of deep darkness that's going through pain, going through the unknown, that may be traveling the ups and downs of life, and you're going through times of lack, you're, you're going through things that don't make sense, things that you say, I didn't deserve this, I didn't cause this, it's more than I imagined. He says, for unto us a child is born, a son is given. Don't read too quickly over that. You'll miss the Christmas connection. How can a child be born and given it's a virgin birth a child is carried in the womb of a young girl but it's conceived by the holy spirit this isn't any child any son this is the christ child the, the son of god luke chapter 1 and verse 30 to 35 the angel says to mary the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever in his kingdom. Of his kingdom there will be no end. Then Mary said to the angel, How can this be? I do not know a man. And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also the Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. A child born, the Son given. And this is Jesus, born of Mary. I want you to know that the promise is not just of a virgin birth, but it's of a birth of a child that has these names, these positions, these promises. Don't miss Christ at Christmas. You will miss all that Christ has for you. You want to have him in your life today, tomorrow, available in your darkness, your deep darkness. Let me give you these five to you. Number one, he is wonderful. It means marvelous. Beyond description, vast and, and uh, way beyond anything we could think. It's beyond our understanding. This child is incomprehensible, full of wonder. And as a result, we stand in awe. And here's the thing, because he's wonderful, listen to me, he answers the deepest need of our life. Every one of us, deep down, we ask this question, what is all this about? We wonder, what is life all about? Why am I here? Is there more to life than this? Is there more to life than my getting up and going to bed, the ins and outs, the ups and downs, the routines, the mundane of life? Is there more to life? We wonder, is there more than what I'm dealing with, than what I, uh, the struggle of life? There has to be more. There has to be something that brings fulfillment that fills the empty void in me, and we wonder. And we look out, we find no answer. But Jesus Christ... He is wonderful. Listen, 
whatever you've ever stood before beside seen and you've looked at and go, wow, that's incredible. I can't believe that. That is so beyond imagination. I can't even get my head wrapped around that. It sort of blows your mind. Can I tell you, Jesus Christ is more than all that. He is so wonderful. He is beyond your understanding. You can't figure him out. His ways are above our ways. His thoughts are above our thoughts. We cannot pull him down to our earthly realm. He is so far above. We can't even figure him out. He's the God of the universe. He's the creator of everything. He shaped the mountains. He dug the oceans. He hung the stars. He created you and gave you breath. Can you figure that out? No, it's too wonderful. Yes, that's Jesus. He's wonderful and he answers the deepest need in your life. Why am I here? Jesus can answer that for you. But he's also counselor. He's wise. He's knowledgeable. He's intelligent. He's full of wisdom. And he isn't just wise, but he's all-knowing. And as a, as a result, he can help us. He can guide us. He can lead us. How often do we go through life and we don't know an answer? We can wake up in the morning and say, yeah, I got the answer. We get in the afternoon and we go, don't know. Get into the evening and go, I'm trying to figure this out. Why? Because we don't have the answers, but God does. And here's the great thing. God knows about your life. He knows your struggle. He knows what you're going through. He knows your difficulties. And he doesn't just know about your failures and your mistakes. God still loves you. And in that love, he comes and says, let me guide you. Let me lead you. Let me show you the right way. He becomes a counselor to us, to advise us, to direct us, to guide us, to lead us. His word becomes a, a light unto our path and, and a lamp and it says under our feet. He guides us in our walk. He speaks to us and helps us in every problem, in every pain. Our Jesus is never confused. You can never surprise him, take him aback. And Jesus never says, hey, I'll get back to you. I don't really have an answer right now. I, I got to go figure this out and I'll, I'll be right back to you. His counsel is unfailing and flawless, perfectly suited to every situation. Come on, it's practical and it's prudent. Can I tell you right now, he knows what's happening where you're alone, in your marriage maybe, in your workplace, in your family, in your children. God, God knows. He is counselor. He understands everything. And he's available to you. Jeremiah 33, 3, he says, call to me. He says, call to me. Pray to me. He says, and I will, I will answer you and I'll show you things that you have never known. That will blow you away that, that you won't even understand. God is there to help us. For unto us a child is born, a son is given. He's the counselor. And because of that, listen, he answers the decisions of our lives. He can answer those questions, those decisions we need to make. Don't miss Christ in Christmas. Number three, he's a mighty God. Jesus is not only able to give us perfect advice, he's able to give us the ability to fulfill the advice he gives us. He becomes the provider of the strength we need. He is mighty God. Can I tell you something? He is not a minimum God, he's a mighty God. You know, too often we go through life and we, we accept our circumstances, situations, our pain, our suffering, our sickness, whatever it is. We go, well, this is the cards dealt to me. I've never been able to deal with this. And we begin to walk in this role of acceptance. We just accept the way life is. Can I tell you something? Jesus never entered a battle that he lost. He's never lost a battle. He's won out every time. And that's because he is mighty God. If God be for us, who can be against us? There is no one, listen to me, there is no one that God cannot rescue and lift you out of the miry clay. It's not, there's no one that he can't restore and revive. There is no one that is so far from God that God's grace cannot reach you. That's the mighty God we have. Matthew 19, 26 says, with God, all things are possible. And that was the word that Mary heard in her own voice. Yeah, as the angel came and declared about this son coming, this child, this virgin birth. With God, all things are possible. It's interesting. But the truths of Jesus in this passage, this is the one that non-believers will struggle with the most. You know, today the world is willing to acknowledge, ah, oh, beautiful baby Jesus. Ah, oh, beautiful baby, cuddly little Jesus. 
Oh, they're just in the swaddling clothes. Baby Jesus in a manger. Love baby Jesus. That's Christ at Christmas. You know, and if it goes only that far, we're okay because it poses no threat to, to the authority and the personal autonomy. You can speak it, you can sing it, the carols, you can, oh, isn't this beautiful? Just thinking about baby Jesus, but you declare that baby Jesus, that baby in the manger, is the king of the universe, the mighty God, holy, infinite, sovereign over all. People don't want anything to do with that. They love the baby, but they don't love the Savior. They love the infant, but they don't love the king of kings. Jesus in a manger is one thing, but Jesus on the throne is another. But for you and I, he is mighty God. Don't miss Christ at Christmas. Fourthly, he is the everlasting father. He is wonderful, counselor, mighty God. Nothing he can't do, no one he can't rescue, no one he can't win because of that mighty God, but he's everlasting father. And listen to me, because of that, he answers, oh, he answers the loneliness of our lives. You know, sometimes we can be around a lot of people and still be alone. Loneliness can still grip our life. And perhaps that's you right now. And you go, is there anybody, anyone that can be with me? Anybody that can feel what I feel? Anybody that can be alongside of me? I'm feeling right now so overwhelmed and I don't believe anybody knows what I'm thinking. We can feel that no one knows what I'm rehearsing over and over in my mind that my emotions are getting caught up, the pain of the heartache, the, the rejection, the loneliness, the abandonment. Nobody knows the betrayal. And then what happens is we go into a circumstance situation. We've got baggage that's building up in our lives and, and how we want to respond to situations and people. But then all of a sudden, baggage from yesterday comes forward. And it's like all of a sudden now we got yesterday's baggage into today and we become overwhelmed and we become just pressed down and, and, and we're, we're alone and I've got all this to deal with by myself. No, you don't. This one that is born unto us is as the everlasting father. He is the exact expressed image of the Godhead. And in that is a fathering, a caring. There, there's a nursing. There's a loving of our lives. You have this one that wants a relationship with you to be like a father unto you, to draw you in as a daughter and as a son and bring acceptance, to hear the words that God said over his son, in whom you're my son, my daughter, in whom I'm well pleased. God has a word for you. He wants to pull you in as a father and bring you into a family, sons and daughters, children, called the body of Christ that you can walk with, that can defend you, that can protect you, that can gather around you. As everlasting Father, He answers the loneliness of life. But lastly, He's the Prince of Peace. And He can have an answer for all the storms of life. He answers all the storms. You know, there are many storms in life. Throughout life, there are small storms and large storms, and they seem to keep coming. They're not an anomaly. They're not something that we should not expect. We expect storms. And I've learned that the peace is not the absence of the storm, but the peace is the presence of the Lord with me in the storm. Hear those words for unto us, unto you, a child is born. I'm glad that God is the creator of the universe. I'm glad that, that he is the uh, uh, one that surrounds me and comes to me when I'm in deep darkness, in my pain, struggle, my confusion. But can I tell you, he comes to us in the storms. He walks on the water to us. He comes over the storms and walks on them victoriously to enter into our lives. Do you need peace in your life? Does it seem like the waves and winds are beating upon your life and your marriage, your home, your struggles of life? You're not sure if you're going to stay afloat? Listen, Jesus wants to come in and bring peace. Bring peace into your life, into your marriage, into your family. You know, Jesus says this peace that I leave you, that I give you, is not like the world gives. He says, my peace is stable. My peace is, is concrete. My peace isn't shallow and fleeting. My peace comes into you because it's me. I am the peace. I am shalom. I am the peace that you need. He brings stability and calm and confidence as we go through. Don't miss Christ in Christmas. Stop and see him. Open your heart and receive him make room for him for unto us a child is born a son is given what do you need right now 
What do you need right now? Do you need the answers? The answer to the deepest things of your life? Why? Why am I here? What's going on? What's my life all about? Do you need the answer to the uh, uh, decisions of life? You're not, not too sure what to do. You need counsel and the people around you can't give you good counsel, but God can. Do you need the answer to the battles of life that you're fighting right now? He's the mighty God. What about to the loneliness of life? He can be the everlasting father. He's not like the earthly fathers. He's a father that's perfect, that's caring, that's loving. But do you also need the answer to the storms of life? Do you need the, the Prince of Peace to come into your heart and life? At his birth, the angel said this child's name would be Jesus, means God's salvation, because he will save his people from their sins. The gift of Christ at Christmas is salvation. Will you accept Christ as your Savior? Will He allow Him to forgive you of your sins and remove the guilt and shame of life? That you can walk in this unity with God the Father. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father. There's a, a relationship breach between us and the Father. And the only way to get that breach restored and come back as a son and daughter to our Creator is through Jesus Christ. He was born for a purpose, to die for our sins that we could have relationship with the Father. His name will be called Jesus, but then it says, and His name will be Emmanuel, meaning God with us. God who will never leave us nor forsake it. God with us today, tomorrow. He is there to be with us if we'll accept Jesus Christ as the Son of God. Believe in our heart, confess with our mouth, says you will be saved. My heart is this Christmas, don't miss Christ in Christmas. There's too much at stake. There's too much beyond the lights and the wrappings and the celebration. It is the provision of Jesus Christ. For unto us, unto you, a child is born, a son is given. If you want to receive Jesus Christ in your heart, simply ask, say, Lord, this Christmas, I don't want to miss Christ at Christmas. Jesus Christ, I believe you are the Son of God. I believe that you are born, that you might die for me, that my sins would be removed from me and guilt and shame would be dealt with, and that I could have my relationship again with the Father who created me. Forgive me, live inside of me. I choose to live for you the rest of my life in Jesus' name. And if you will say that prayer, you will find Christ at Christmas. Please contact us. If you said that prayer for the first time, we'd want to hear about it. We want to pray with you and guide you further. Join us again next Sunday, 10 a.m. or in person at the church, Progressive Academy. God bless you and Merry Christmas.